tonight uh, we have a Renya Iyer um, and her topic is nature's DPS, which is bird navigation strategies. We are super excited about this topic. I have been waiting all week and I think a lot of our staff members have been as well. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the community program coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. Um, I want to say special thanks before we get started to Credit Valley Conservation for making this webinar and other programs at Riverwood possible. And before we get to today's presentation, we have a couple housekeeping notes as well. All of our April webinars are up on our website, including our spring break programs. Every afternoon next week, we are hosting free webinars on a new topic, so please sign up. I will post all of the links in the chat. And if you have the financial means to, to support our programs and conservation of Riverwood's lands, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org. We would greatly appreciate it. And today we have Aranya Iyer, who is a master's student at Western User University with the Department of Geography and the Environment. Her project centers on building mathematical models to learn how birds make decisions during migration. Specifically, she studies how birds may use magnetic cues to navigate. Sadly, her work does not test if putting a magnet in your yard will attract that one rare bird you are chasing, which we would all think is very, very helpful, Aranya. So if you can get on that. <laughs> She's also interested in science communication and how to make academia accessible. Check out her work on Instagram at nerd meets bird, and I will post that in the chat as well. Now, before I hand it off to Arenya, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Navy nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. If you have questions during this presentation, please type them in the Q&A tab or the chat bar. And if you're watching from Facebook, I will be reading the comments and questions as well and bring them back to the group. And I will be posting some resource links in the chat in just a few moments. So Arenya, welcome, and I will hand it over to you. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And that was a really kind introduction. Um, I am a master's student um, and I am in the Department of Geography and I'm, I study birds and I love talking about them constantly and at any opportunity that I get. Um, so this is one of those opportunities and I'm so stoked to be here. Um, today we're going to be talking about some really cool things that these birds do during migration. Um, but before we get started, kind of just to get in the same headspace um, as a bird, we're going to do a little bit of a visualization exercise um, to get to really appreciate what the birds are going through and what it's like to be a bird. So to do that, I know it's a little bit silly, but you're going to have to pretend to be your favorite migratory bird. For example, I'm going to pretend to be a black and warbler. You can pretend to be anything we're gonna take a trip from the Amazon all the way up to Riverwood. Okay, so get in your mind your favorite bird um, and let me just get set up here to take you through this visualization. Okay, so hopefully you've picked your favorite bird at this point um, and I need you to look down at your fingers. They're not fingers, of course not, they're wings. And those noses that you have, hopefully only just one, um, it's actually a beak and your body is full of feathers and your feet are talons. I have waved my wand and you are your now favorite migratory bird. So let's start off in the lush forests of the Amazon. It's around March, the weather is nice and warm. It's humid. There's shrooky trees and moss hanging out, and you feel this sudden urge to get moving more. There's this restlessness in your body, and you just gotta get moving. There's flashes in your head about this place where you grew up in so many moons ago. It has pine trees and oak trees, and it looks a little bit different from where you are now. So you start moving north and see that your fellow birdmates in this Zoom call are also doing so. After some time, you hit the coast. It's really in front of you. You don't really know where to go next. Both of you 
but there's something happening. Wait, there it is. That's your magnetic compass just getting aligned. It tells you that you're roughly above the equator and you need to head north, which is straight in front of you that way, right across this big blue ocean. But because you know that journey is gonna be a little bit long, you sit back and you know have a little bit of yummy insects to chomp on and get a little bit chubby because all of that is gonna help you cross this big ocean. And then one day when the wind is just right and the weather is perfect, you start flying. It's an ideal day to set sail. And as you pass over this big blue ocean, you're using your magnetic compass to know where you are. You're looking at the position of the sun and the position of the stars to really get going in the right direction and to make sure you're on the right course. After some time, what is that you see? Is it land? and restaurants and trees and blue lights from little coastal residences. Try your best not to fly into a little bit of lights at night because, you know, sometimes humans are forgetful and forget to turn off the light during migration. After some intense navigating, you find a nice patch of forest to settle in near the coast and you eat a couple insects and then get a little bit of rest. The next morning, you start heading north again. You pass by big fields and you pass by just lots of cities and beautiful humans moving below you. You get to another large body of water. Now it's not as big as the last one you think, it's, but it looks like a great big lake. And that's when it hits you as you start crossing this water body. <laughs> smell of maple syrup and ketchup chips and timbits. That smells familiar. You keep heading towards that perfect concoction of smells that reminds you of home. And what is that? Is that the sign for Riverwood? And is that the Tim Hortons right outside of Riverwood where all the humans stop by to get their coffee? This smells just right. And you keep on going until you look at the tree that was your own home where you grew up. Now, isn't that the ideal spot? to rest for a bit. <laughs> Congratulations, look at you guys. You made it all the way from Amazon to Riverwood in less than five minutes. Can you imagine that birds have to make such a long trek over the course of days and some birds just do it continuously all in one go? What we're gonna talk about is how they do it. Okay, uh, I just need to get set up and talk. Um, share my screen. So I'm going to give you guys to evolve out of your birds and into humans again while I do this. Okay, I hope you see your feathers changing back into bodies. Awesome. Okay, so birds, why do they migrate in the first place? Well, they migrate one from the north to the south to escape winter harshness. Now, that's important because as a bird, you have limited resources. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're in a place in winter where there's enough food for you to eat. And you also don't have to spend all of it trying to thermoregulate, which means you don't have to spend all of your time trying to keep your body warm. So it's easier sometimes to spend that energy into migrating into warmer places. But then why do birds migrate back to the north if it's also nice and great in the tropical lands? Well. It's because of this idea of breeding. So researchers, they found that when you move north and when you make that effort to migrate, a lot of the birds actually have more babies when they're in the north compared to the, their counterparts in the tropical areas. So while you're spending all of that time and energy and effort going from Mexico to Canada, you get payoff in the sense that you have more babies in your clutch. That's essentially what it means. So that's essentially a very rough idea of why the birds migrate. How they migrate is what, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about. To illustrate how birds navigate and truly what that term means, I'm gonna talk about an experiment. It deals with white crowned sparrows. Hopefully a few of you are at least familiar with these birds they are gonna be coming in very soon. Um, but this experiment happens during fall migration when we have beautiful birds like this. 
um, not birds, well, also birds, but beautiful trees and colors like this. And so what researchers did is for these birds that we find in the US and Canada, they got and trapped some adults and some juveniles. These birds originally were around the Washington area. Now, if they're in the Washington area and they're migrating in the fall, so going back to their wintering grounds in the tropics, you would expect these birds from Washington to go near Texas, so going in the southeast direction. What these researchers did is they took these birds and gave them a first-class flight all the way to New Jersey. So there are three things that could happen here to the birds. Either one, they recognize that they're not in the position that they should be. They're not in the location that's familiar to them. And they try and head back to the location that is. So in this case, they would try and head back towards Washington. The second option is these birds recognize that they're not in the place they should be, but they know the place they want to be going off the bat. They know they want to go to South and Central America. So they shift their migratory direction and start heading southwest knowing that eventually they'll meet up with their buddies somewhere in Texas in some time, and then they will all migrate down. Or the third option is that the bird, maybe they recognize that they're in a different place, but they don't know what to do with that information. All they know is that during fall migration, I am going to head southeast regardless of where I am. And so the birds could then be heading southeast. True navigation is when the birds recognize not only that they're at a different place, but they use that information to then make a decision and go towards their original goal. What these researchers found is that the juvenile birds actually didn't, they couldn't navigate. They didn't have an idea of where they needed to be. This was their first time, this was their first year navigating, first year migrating too. So it seems that they had some kind of innate learning, some kind of map that they were born with in some way that told them that around this time, start heading southeast. And they weren't able to do anything more when they got displaced. It was the adults though that were capable of performing true navigation. They knew that something was wrong, but they also had experience with the landscape. They'd been through some routes before and they knew how to correct for this displacement. How did they do that? What techniques do they have in their toolbox? There are five of them that we can discuss, and I'm going to hand it over to you to tell me which one you want me to talk about. So this is going to be a kind of pick your own adventure kind of thing. So the people on Zoom, I want you to tell me what you want to discover. I don't want to just keep laughing. Um, so we'll hopefully have some sort of consensus on which ones people are kind of leaning towards more. And then based on that, I will continue the presentation. So you should see a poll question on your screen. There are five options. There's magnetism, smell, landmarks, group behavior, and sun and stars. Um, and I would like you to pick which one kind of speaks to you more, which one interests you. And we'll close the poll in a little bit. Um, so get your votes in and get your voice heard. Voting is important, everybody, in this case, too. Okay, I'm going to pick two. Why not? Seems like a close call here. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Can you see the outcomes, Aranya, or do you want me to announce it? Yeah, if you could announce it, that would be great. Yeah, so most people have voted now. We're about 90% and it's leaning Perfect. towards magnetism to start. I love it. It's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's start there. Hopefully we'll eventually hit the rest too. Um, so with magnetism, geomagnetism is essentially the magnetism of Earth. And it's super cool because just the idea of someone first discovering the magnetic field and being like, I wonder if there's an invisible force field around Earth and being like, maybe I should research that. And so they found first that there was a geomagnetic field and it kind of looks like the thing that we have on the screen. It's sources of like the, the reasons it's created is varied and is so different, but it's kind of like a cloak around the Earth that protects us from a lot of the harmful rays um, of the sun. So the second thing that's interesting about geomagnetism is someone somewhere had a wonderful thought of being like, and now I wonder that birds are tapping into this invisible cloak of the geomagnetic field. I don't know how they can see it, but maybe they can. In fact, the only places that we're actually able to see the geomagnetic field 
is in these northern and southern lights. So the field lines that you see are actually field lines mimicking that Earth's magnetic field. It's when it's interacting with the atmosphere and the particles and the sun's rays and creating these beautiful designs, which is really the only physical, almost physical representation we have of the geomagnetic field. So it's expected that a lot of different species can sense and detect the magnetic field and use it for migration anything from birds to turtles to whales to fishes and even insects. And what you might be wondering is, well, how do they detect the geomagnetic field? How do they even use it to migrate? One hypothesis, and this is particularly for the species that are in water, it's believed they have an organ called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And what this organ does is it, it's, it's, it has receptors in it, in its bodies. So it has body parts that are able to detect electricity. And so what you see on the screen is kind of where these little organs and nerve endings are. What people think is because of the interaction of electricity and magnetism in, a, in an environment like the marine waters, that all of these species that are in water are able to use these receptors also to detect the magnetic field. This is a little bit complicated. The second way that people think that um, species can detect the magnetic field is a little bit more intuitive. It's just having magnetic particles. In fact, that's how the compass works, right? So it has a magnet in it and it's able to tell us the magnetic field. So the hypothesis here, so the idea here, is that all of these animals have some magnetic thing in them that's able to detect the magnetic field. For birds, a lot of people thought that it's in their beak, that the magnets are actually in their beak and that's what's helping them detect the magnetic field. That is not necessarily the case. Just because something exists doesn't mean it has an entire purpose in the way that it does. For example, if you stick your head inside a microwave, images of your brain will show that your brain is somehow reading the microwave waves. That doesn't mean you have a microwave sense. It just means that your body has in some way a capacity to intercept that. And yeah, for as far as I know, no one I know uses microwave senses to migrate, or you don't for sure. Um, the third thing, the way that it's assumed that species use um, information from the magnetic field is through this idea called radical magnetoreception. So here, what it's the idea is it's a little bit more based on things like chemicals and molecules. The way that the light travels, so the way that you're even able to see anything on the screen is because your eyes are looking at the light waves and then interpreting what in your brain you are seeing. So that's a turtle because your brain is looking at the waves and interpreting it as a turtle. What we think is happening for birds is that when certain waves of length um, wavelengths of light are hitting the eyes of birds, it's activating this radical, so a molecule in their body. And this specific molecule, depending on the magnetic field, changes its behavior. So in different magnetic fields, it'll have different behavior, which will lead to different products, which then could result in something like the bird seeing different things because of the magnetic field. So because it's linked to eye, they think that maybe the birds will be able to see areas that are darker or lighter based on the magnetic field and then use that information to navigate. That is so cool. So what really tells us that birds can in fact do something with this information? For that, we're going to need to look at another experiment. So this is a Eurasian reed warbler. It exists, as the name suggests, in Europe. Um, I tried to find a, a bird that was similar to this in North America, but there isn't really a very close relatives to this bird, but let's just assume it's a bird. It's a migratory bird. And here they use this experiment setup called these Emlyn funnels. Emlyn funnels are essentially where you have a bird in a funnel with a wire over it so that it can escape. And in that funnel, inside of it, there's paper all around. The bird itself is in the middle and it's sitting on an ink pad. So when the bird is trying to escape and move, all of these little ink um, marks tell us which direction the bird is most likely to go to. And so in spring, when they do these experiments, they find that the birds are more likely to go north. 
And that makes sense. We see that coming up here in the markings and in these diagrams that they're made of these markings. Um, and it tells us that in spring, birds are most likely to head north. In fall, we find that the markings are reversed. And again, that makes sense. They're going from places like Canada all the way south to places like Mexico. So the markings are in the opposite direction. What they did with this experiment was they had these place, had these birds in Rick, I don't know how to say this. I think it's Rybaki, Russia. Um, and they had just geomagnetic information. So they put these birds in just a natural environment that had normal geomagnetic field as the birds would be, you know, kind of sensing and detecting it in these funnels. They found that most of the markings showed that the birds were going southwest. Now, just using magnets near these funnels, what the researchers were able to do was simulate another location on the Earth's magnetic, on the Earth's surface. So they used magnets to represent Scotland instead of Russia, while the birds still remained in Russia. So the only thing that changed was the magnetic field. What they found from the markings is that the birds changed their direction of movement, which means that the birds were aware of the fact that the magnetic information had changed and they changed their behavior based on that. Now, as Stephanie said in the introduction, I can't just put a big magnet by these birds and expect them to come to me. All of those rare, I would be the most famous person in the bird community if I was able to do that and get all the rare birds with me. But we can't do that. What my project does is essentially look at, well, how are these birds integrating all of this information on the fly when they're actually going from one location to another? So I get information from these satellites that are going across the Earth and collecting geomagnetic data. Then I take all of that information from satellites and I attach it to a bird track. So birds carry sometimes these little tags that, they, that we put on them that tell us their location and where they are at what certain points. Based on that, so this is a beautiful prothonotary warbler. Um, based on those tracks, I can then attach that satellite magnetic information to it. And with that, I'm able to tell things like, oh, this greater fronted goose that was take white front, greater white fronted goose that was wearing a tag, it's going from places um, like here in Berlin, which has high geomagnetic intensity, to places like Russia that has low geomagnetic intensity. So based on this, I can create models to really understand how the birds are integrating all of this information on the fly when they're going from one location to another. Speaking of, we're going to head back to our home location. Um, if you have any specific questions for geomagnetism, feel free to type them in the box. Um, but the poll will be up soon, and you will hopefully get to choose what the next navigation strategy you want to discover is. Yeah, and that's awesome. So many interesting things. I think everyone's in awe right now. <laughs> um, there's not too many specific questions coming in, so I think we'll hold those questions until the end. Um, but yes, if there's any specific questions to magnetism, we'll take them in the chat bar right now or the Q&A tab. Um, also on Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook, please comment down below. I'm watching that as well. Mm -hmm. And we'll just give it a couple more seconds here for the rest of the viewers to vote on the next journey. It is leaning towards... Sun and stars, it looks like. Ooh, okay, cool. Um, should I get started? I think so. It's it's pretty much in the lead. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> it makes sense. Um, let's do sun and stars then. Awesome. Okay, so this one is intuitive to me in the sense that it makes sense that we're looking at the position of the sun and the stars to really understand the location of the birds, but it is a little bit hard to understand, so you're going to have to bear with me. We're going to... Um, and then use that to know what time it is. If you're like me, 
daylight savings time is a really hard time for you because your internal body clock and the sun's clock are way out of whack. So I feel like this lady who screams at like, why is it midnight at 527? And so for me, that gives me an idea that my body clock and the sun's clock are related in some way. I don't know how many of you feel this way, but I assume it's quite a bit. Monarch butterflies are migrants that are assumed to use the sun in order to navigate. So they're not birds, but they're also an amazing migrant that also visit riverwood. So I thought it would be, you know, apt to talk about them. Again, if we go back to the basics, we think that birds, well, we know that the day starts at 7 and ends at 7 p.m. roughly, starts at 7 a.m., ends at 7 p.m., that the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. And if we're heading north, then in the morning, the sun will be to your right. And if you keep heading north in the evening, the sun will be to your left. So as a monarch butterfly, um, if you're heading north and you're coming to Riverwood, in the morning, you would expect the sun to be to your right. And in the evening, you would expect the sun to be to your left. Now, how do we really test if birds are using the sun in order to navigate? What researchers did is they threw the body clock of these monarch butterflies totally out of whack. So they made 1 a.m., 7 a.m., they made 7 p.m., 1 p.m. So they shifted the times for the birds to see what would happen. Do they change their direction of navigation when we, when we change their body clock and how it relates to the sun? So 7 became 1, 10 became 4. When they tested these birds at 10 a.m., they found that these birds that had the shifted clock actually didn't behave like normal birds. Sorry, not birds, obviously not birds, but butterflies. In fact, these butterflies changed their direction of travel. Now, I know what you're going to say. That's really hard to understand. What are all these numbers? It's Friday night. I don't get it. Let's try to break it down into a level that kind of makes sense more intuitively to me jet lag, well, at least in the time when we, you know, in the era that we could travel, jet lag is essentially your body clock and the sun's clock not really matching up. And the behavior of everyone around you and also yourself not matching up between what your body wants to do and what the sun wants to do. So this is very similar to what the researchers made the butterflies feel. One was that they understood that the clock of the bird, when you mess with that, it messed with their behavior. And the fact that it was related to the sun gives us an idea that the bird, that the butterflies are actually using the sun, are calibrating their internal clocks to it and changing their behavior in relation to that. Similar to how we change our behavior when our clocks and the sun and the things that we're supposed to do don't really line up. You're not supposed to eat breakfast at 4 a.m. in the morning. That's kind of what the feeling of jet lag and kind of what the feeling of jet lag to butterflies might be when they migrate. So they try to compensate for it as time goes on. The stars are a lot easier to understand. Um, here, the experiment dealt with the indigo buntings. They have beautiful song. You'll see them around Riverwood, hopefully in a month or so. Um, and the what they did here was again, they use these funnels. I'm not gonna explain them again because we've been through it once, but the general idea is there should be more scratches in the direction that they're supposed to be going. So in the spring, it's to the north, there's more scratches there, and in the fall, it's to the south and more scratches there. So what the researchers found is that just putting these funnels um, and birds inside them, so these indigo buntings inside them, when they put it under the natural sky, all the birds headed south. So this was during fall when they were moving from places like Canada to places like Mexico. But when they brought these birds inside a planetarium, which is somewhere where you can simulate the night sky, not exactly in the same way, which is why this picture is a little bit blurry, but almost in a similar way. They found that when they simulated the night sky, as it would be as they saw it outside, the birds kept on heading south all great, that is what we expected. And then when they flipped the sky, because you can do that in a planetarium, because you're actually showing it through projectors, they found that the birds actually reversed their direction of migration. That means 
that they were using just the stars to know where they were going and the rotation of the stars to change their migration direction. The researchers also found that when it was cloudy and when the birds didn't have access to the stars above them, their navigation and direction and orientation just went all random, meaning that there wasn't really a cue to guide them in one direction. Literally, there wasn't a North Star guiding them. And so this tells us that birds are interacting with the sky and the celestial cues in order to navigate. It's not necessarily as clean and as straightforward as we would hope to be. And it's kind of hard to test that because it's hard to test things like changing your body clock and changing the position of the stars, because we also have to understand that. Um, but what researchers have found is that in a general way, the birds are using the sun during the day and the position and the movement of the sun and the, and the patterns of the stars at night to really navigate and know where they're going. Okay, where we're going is back to the main page. And there are a couple questions coming through. I think we'll just try to get through two right now, if that's okay with you, Perfect, um, yeah. that are specific to what you just talked about. So the first mm -hmm. one is, how was the body clock of the butterfly and bird actually changed? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so how they changed it was when you bring these uh, species into a lab environment, they kind of remove all the other cues and then they use things like artificial light to mimic when sun up would be and when sun down would be. So they shifted their clock by removing all of their cues and telling the birds that I want your sun rise to be at 1 a.m. And so they would turn the lights on super bright. So eventually that would make them think that that 1 a.m. was related to their sun up and that they would shut their lights off at 1 p.m. Meaning the birds eventually got used to the fact that it was 1 p.m. at that point. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question came in from Kendra, which is a really good question, actually. So mm -hmm. how do you combine these migratory factors? If they know their direction with the magnetic field, and then again, mm -hmm. with the position of the stars, to what extent does each factor in? Do you know the answer to that? Or is that a bigger question? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. And I would be surprised if anyone did. Yeah. Um, especially in the research communities, you have kind of different camps and there'll be like everyone who'll be like, go magnetism. And then they'll be fighting with the people who'll be like, it's only smell. Um, <laughs> and so it's a very like niche battle. Um, but in reality, I think what is probably happening is that they're integrating multiple cues together. And this is a great kind of blend in from the moment where the birds couldn't really see the sky. Um, if they can't see the sky and they still have to navigate well, technically, if they can do geomagnetism at night, they could still use things like geomagnetic fields in order to navigate. So there is a little bit of redundancy, but maybe that redundancy is built in for safety, that they can do the same thing in different ways through different um, methods so that they can eventually reach their goals. So maybe they're using one primary thing and maybe it changes by species um, and maybe it changes by location. But when that isn't available, maybe they're using other cues in order to navigate. Wow. So yeah. a lot more research to be done. <laughs> so much more research, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, though. That's a, that's a great question um, and hard to answer for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we'll do the next poll question. Is that okay with you? That would be perfect. Thank you. Where would you like Aranya to take us next? So I think what we have left is smell, landmarks, and group behavior. Yeah, we did the bookends, which worked out really nice. Yeah. Just the middle is left. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And again, it's kind of equal here. Mm. We'll give it a couple more seconds. We just have 60%. Come on, everyone. We can get to 100. <laughs> <laughs> All those moments when you couldn't pick where Dora should go. This is your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's your adult version, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or kids. Kids can be watching, too. <laughs> um, okay, so I think the winner is doo -doo -doo, smell. Smell Ooh. won by just a little bit. Yes. Maybe it was my vote. I voted for smell. Um, <laughs> it, it cost way more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite ones. 
Um, smell is really interesting and fascinating. And another word for it, um, for the sensory system that's related to smell is olfactory. Um, smell is really interesting because, you know, back when we, we would be able to go to people's houses, when you would enter their house, you would be hit with a smell and you'd be like, you smell like your house. And sometimes when you come back from traveling and you walk into your own home, you're just like, and so this is what I smell like. This is my home. Um, similar to that, it's assumed that birds have some sense of smell and a smell map in their brain. But before we get into that, we have to ask the question, do birds even have nostrils? How do they smell? Um, and it turns out they do. They do have nostrils and they're called nares. In the steep eagle, you see this very clearly illustrated. They've got real big nostrils. Um, something in North America that has huge nostrils is the turkey vultures. So these are scavengers and they find their food by smelling it out. They're finding, you know, when you are crossing a highway and you know that something's been dead, there's a very strong scent to it. And so scavengers like turkey vultures that feed on that have a really heightened sense of smell. You'll also notice they have a see-through nostril here, which is really interesting. Um, and the idea behind that is because when they're putting their head in, to eat the meat, all of their stuff is, all of it, it's getting everywhere on their face. It's also the reason they're bald. So when they lift their head, all they really have to do is squeeze their nose. So all of the excess things that were stuck in their nostrils, all the little boogers are just kind of getting out. Anyways, basically just to say that birds have nostrils, they can clean them, and they're using their sense of smell, at least on some level that we know. One really interesting application of smell for birds is that some people think that birds also use smell for mating. So the scary picture of the crested auklets that you see, really, it's believed that the crests that they have have this like lemony citrusy scent, and they use that during mating. So these two are getting all up in each other's nares, um, trying to smell all of that. Um, but smell is also used for migration. And a smell map while we can't really know how it's happening in a bird's head, we can kind of imagine and picture a smell map. So this lady called Kate McLean, Kate McLean, um, made a smell map of Edinburgh. And so what she did was she walked around the different places and recorded what smells are most important in what parts of the city to really understand what the city smells like. And as you would expect, places near the coast had the strongest smell of things like the sea, the sand, and the beach. And the middle of the city had the strongest smell of brewery and malt fumes. And then the suburbs, kind of the ends of it, had smells of newly fresh cut grass. Now that's fascinating. And we think that birds also kind of have this smell map in their head where they know where their smell of home is like, and they also know where they're at. And they can kind of know that I want to head towards apples because it smells like home. One bird where they tested this out was in the lesser black-backed gull. Again, it's a European species, but actually it's, it, it visits Canada quite a bit and often, and they've seen a couple in Port Credit. Um, and this experiment deals with this piece of land called Heligoland. Um, it's part of Germany. It has fascinating World War II history behind it. I would totally encourage anyone who's into history and a history buff to check it out. Um, but essentially what they did was they took these birds initially from Finland and then gave these birds also similar to the sparrows that we talked about earlier a first class flight to Heligoland kind of this island in the middle of nowhere. What they did to these birds that during fall were supposed to be going from Finland to their southern uh, wintering grounds in Africa. Um, so when they displaced these birds they expected that the birds given everything else intact and having all of their cues and all of their sensory systems, would eventually join back with their group heading from Finland all the way down to Africa. But what the researchers did to test smell is they snipped a nerve in the bird's brain that was related to smell. So a bird's brain, similar to our brain, has a whole bunch of nerve endings that are important for a whole bunch of different things. So what they did was they picked out the specific one for smell and they snipped it. What they found is for these birds who had their nerve ending for smell snipped, they didn't join up with their friends. They couldn't do true navigation as we talked about. 
In fact, with this impaired sense of smell, they reverted back to what the juveniles did. So they reverted back to their innate learning. They just kept heading southeast. I mean, eventually um, it would bring them back, hopefully to their wintering ground in some way. But what they found was that the sense of smell here is really important. It, they need that intact in order to determine where to go. Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting study that showed that, you know, sense of smell is also important and not necessarily something that we would think of in terms of long distance migration, but smell for birds is important for their migration. And so that's essentially what this means. For North America, they did a similar study with the gray catbird. It's really cute. It has a cute little orange um, butt that it flashes ever so often. And they found really similar results here. Here they didn't snip the nerve endings. What they did was kind of just block their nares. And they found similarly that with these birds, they couldn't navigate in the same way. Then they did a study with white-throated sparrows also in North America and found a similar thing. When they were blocking either their magnetic sense or their smell sense, they couldn't navigate. So that's what it means. It still means that we have a little bit more research to do, but the fact that it's kind of replicated in Europe and in North America gives us an idea that this is an important navigation strategy. Um, and that brings us back to our poll to discover the next one. Awesome. And just a couple questions coming in about that. Um, mm -hmm. Aranya, uh, do different birds use some cues more than others? Do, do we know the answer to that one? Ooh. Um, and I guess similarly to that, uh, Catherine had asked, like, how do you choose what birds you're going to test what experiment on? Right. Oh, the great questions, everybody. <laughs> I'm really uh, hard questions, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it is assumed that some birds do use one sense more than another and that some birds have more of a leaning. Mm -hmm. um, I can't list off the top of my head which birds have which sense and which ones use it more. Um, but in terms of experiments specifically, we tend to choose migratory birds because that's where we see a signal happening most. For my own project, I'm going to be working with the shorebird. It's a semi palmated sandpiper um, that carried a little radio tag that went all the way from Alaska to Brazil. And so we chose that bird specifically for my work because I know it's a night migrant, which kind of cuts out the idea of using landmarks. So if I'm trying to test it and find results, it makes sense to use a bird that doesn't have a specific cue or is kind of being restricted in the queue to get more of a signal in the other ones. And so they kind of do experiments based on what they want to see. So it kind of pushes their results in one way. Um, but the general idea is to use migratory birds in order to test these. And then after that, it just becomes a matter of convenience. Which birds do we have more access to? Which ones are more common so we're not really hurting their populations? Things like that. Awesome. So I'm going to put the next poll up. And we'll see. The last two we have, I think, it's landmarks and group behaviors. Mm -hmm. And just while we get votes in, um, Aranya, Marvin had said, love your passion about your research. We all need a little more enthusiasm around us during these tough times. So somebody is very grateful for your presentation this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. So kind of you. Um, do we have time for two or are we doing just one? It's up to you. Let's try to do one more and then we'll see what you think. Uh, it looks like we, people are sticking around for a longer presentation, so I think they really like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can ask the chat. If you want to do two more, you can post in the chat if you want to stick around for two more kind of sections, mm -hmm. um, or we can cut it off at an hour. Perfect. And I think uh, group behaviors has one, Aranya, so... Ooh, and everyone perfect. in the chat is now saying, please, more, too, possible. Let's keep going. Yes, I don't know if you see the chat right now, but people are so excited. That's um, awesome. So group behaviors is uh, the next stop. Okay, perfect. Let's head to group behaviors. Um, as a human who feels a lot of peer pressure, um, group behavior is a really interesting one to figure out and to test. Um, and it's also one of the hardest ones to test. If you've ever tried to run a classroom or get people to pay attention, 
it is so hard to get to wrangle up a group of folks to be able to do things. Um, so we need to get creative with the way we test this. But before we get there, group behavior is fascinating in the bird world. The most famous example probably that everyone knows is the mind seagulls from Finding Nemo. Um, these are a perfect example of group behavior and how one kind of leads to a cascade of all the others. Other examples you might have seen could be the lesser flamingos. Um, you kind of see them moving all in one direction and you see, you might have seen videos of them kind of behaving in a similar way. European starlings and other starlings are also capable of doing this murmurations where they create these beautiful figures as groups. Um, and they're not doing it intentionally as far as we know, but as humans, we can interpret these images to be beautiful designs. This one, I think, kind of looks like a raccoon sleeping on its side, um, but that's up for your interpretation too. Um, this one to me looks like a whale. This one looks like a Christmas stocking. This one, the birds maybe saw Inception, and so the birds created their own birds in their own bird form. Um, but the ones that are probably closest to us at home in Canada are geese. Um, and so geese, Canada geese, we see them flying in these beautiful V formations. Um, and we see that geese and cranes and bigger birds especially have this capability of kind of forming these shapes and what we think is helping them migrate to lessen the load um, for all of the for all of the birds as they make these like treacherous journey. And so a goose that we're going to be studying this time is the barnacle goose. I'm sorry if a lot of my experiments are from the Europe, that's where most of this work seems to be coming out from. Um, but the barnacle goose is very similar to the brant goose that we have in Canada, which is just a hop, skip, and jump away from the majestic Canada goose. Um, and so this experiment is done from the UK. And so these birds originally in the UK, they need to stop along several sites before they reach their northern sites. And so it was believed that earlier on in history, they used to stop at this place called Helgeland on the Norwegian coast. Recently though, in recent years, groups and groups of these barnacle goose have been stopping at a place called Westerlin. Uh, I don't know the spelling of that, but similar to essentially they're moving a little bit more north to a place on the Norwegian coast. Now, why are they doing that? If you were outside in Ontario today, you know that climate change feels a little bit more close to home. And so these rapid increase in temperatures um, could be a reason why these birds are moving further and further north. So they want the conditions that historically they had access to because that maybe helped them migrate because that was what gave them the good food conditions. Um, but now they have to move just a little bit northern to get those same conditions. And we know that birds are being affected by climate change and especially at the moments of their laying and their moments of migration. And so all of it is tied together. But how do we really get into the bird's mind to understand what is happening? For that, we can't have just a group of geese and train them and you know, get them to behave in the way that we want. Instead, what we need are models. Not those kinds, we need models using this beautiful piece of art, which is a computer. So we can build models on computers to help us understand what is happening. So what we do is we tell the computer, well, I have a group of geese and the result I want is a group of these geese starting from the UK that initially went to a site lower in Norway to a site higher in Norway in a couple of generations. So you're telling the computer the, um, what you want in the beginning and then what you want in the end. And then you give the computer a bunch of conditions for it to figure out and to make this possible. So you can tell coding or you can tell a coder or someone who understands this language to be like, okay, I want you to tell the computer to consider things like, do these birds have to be in groups? Is it the younger ones that are moving the um, groups from one location to another? Is it the greenery of the grass that's causing them to migrate? It, does it have to do with the number of geese? Does it have to do with memory? Does it have to do with what is being switched? So you put all of that information into the computer. If this is a little bit confusing to understand, think about it in terms of this. 
if someone gave you a whole bunch of ingredients and said, make me this cake, you could theoretically make a hundred cakes and figure out which one is closest to the one that they'd want you to make. Or you could be a lazy human like I am, and you could tell the computer, well, I have these ingredients and I want this cake. I'm going to give you things that I think are important in getting from these ingredients to a cake. For example, can you tell me when I should crack the eggs first? How much flour do I add each time? What do I, when do I add the food coloring? Most importantly, can I eat it yet? And what about now? But essentially the computer, you're telling this computer these things that you think are important and it's gonna run through multiple simulations so that you can get as close to your product as you want. That's essentially what these researchers did. They didn't have millions and millions of yeast, but what they had was tools like this coding and like computer. And so what they were able to find was that yes, it is important for this change to happen for these birds to be in groups. And yes, it's the younger ones actually that we see kind of switching more often, but it's not that they're switching sites, it's that they're switching groups. And it does have something to do with the number of geese that they see at each site. All of this and what it means for group behavior is essentially that in order for this switch to happen, in order for these geese to collectively make a decision such that such large numbers of them were able to go from this place south of Norway to north of Norway, all of these factors were important. And all of this was communicated through groups because these barnacle geese are a group animal and all of that was important and all of that was communicated somehow for them to make a decision during migration. And that will bring us back to our last one, if we still have time. Yes, you are good to go. I think we'll hold all the questions until the end up to this point. So if you have any more questions for Aranya, if you're on Facebook watching, you can comment below, or if you want to post in the chat or the Q&A bar, please do. And I think Landmarks is the last one. Right? Yes. All right. Um, right in the middle. That was the like one that I wanted to choose. <laughs> That's the one I want to know about. <laughs> so um, uh, we'll go on to the next part. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Okay. So landmarks. Um, this is also quite easy for us to picture as humans um, because we use landmarks. For example, I go from London, Ontario to Mississauga, Ontario. I've done that trip at least 12 times, and I wouldn't be able to do that trip without Google Maps. But God forbid, if someone took my Google Maps away, I won't know which streets I'm going to. What I'll know is, well, that's the Esso gas station, and I know I have to turn right from there. And that's the sign for 401, and I know I have to go into that. I use landmarks in order to go from one place to another. So when I put a screen like that, like this in front of you, your mind immediately is able to distinguish certain landmarks on the screen. You are able to know that this is ocean, then it's beach, then it's rock, then it's trees, this might be a walkway, and this might be someone's house. Your brain is able to distinguish these different features of a landscape. Are birds doing the exact same thing? Well, we think kind of for the, at least for the bigger landscape features they are. For example, this beautiful coastline, they recognize it as a coastline and they're able to kind of use it as a leading line to go from one place to another. Things like mountains, that's a landscape feature that's huge and they're able to recognize that, oh, I probably shouldn't cross that. And then landscape features such as urban towns and cities, there's so many features within them that they could be using in order to know which direction to go. And the fact that we live on Earth, which is this big blue planet that naturally has so many different landscape features, like think about it. There are huge oceans separating land masses. There are huge mountain ranges that are separating it. There are so many natural barriers and natural features that birds could be using in order to navigate. And so when we have a vagrant, which is when a bird that has somehow defied all rules of landscape features and has somehow managed to go from Europe to Canada crossing this big ocean, 
we have things like this in the bird community where everyone is kind of just looking up at that one tiny bird in the tree and no one really knows what they're looking at, but they know it's important. Um, and it's important to figure out that, oh yeah, they're looking at this because it's a marvelous feat that this tiny bird was able to cross so many barriers and overcome all of these different landscape signals in order to get where it is. And so a bird that they use to really figure out landscape features is surprisingly the pigeon. Now, I don't know about any of you, but pigeons at one point were able to be carriers. And the reason they were able to be letter carriers and pigeon passenger pigeons and like pigeon carriers in the first place is because of the pigeon's ability to home. What this means is that when you take a pigeon and take it away from its home, somehow it's able to come back to its home loft to be with its friends. And so back in the olden days, um, when we didn't have things like Facebook and internet, so this is way back, um, what these people used to do is they would carry these pigeons with them when they traveled. And when they had a message to send back home, which was near the home of these pigeons, what they did was they attached a letter to these birds and then gave them away hoping that these birds were somehow fly back to their home. Someone would recognize that there was a bird letter attached to the bird near their home and they would somehow capture this bird and then read the letter. So there was a lot of uncertainty and I don't know if how, if and how this really worked, but if there's a painting of it, apparently it happened. Um, but what they really want to focus in on is this ability of this pigeon to be able to find its home. And to do that, it's assumed that they have some sort of a mosaic map in their head, which means that they know central locations and they know how they relate to each other. For example, in the middle, I know this is my home loft. Off to the side, I know that that's where I like feeding. It's just to the left of it. I know to the right of it, there's a beautiful fountain in which I can take baths. I know to the bottom left of it is a place where I can meet with my friends. So they have some sort of a mosaic map in their head. And what researchers believe is that some species have this and they have a piloting map. So something that's called steeple chasing in the sense that when you're just at the bird's eye view and you're able to see just the steeples of churches or the pointy parts of all of the roofs, Birds know, so the map in their head is that, oh, this is steeple A, and because I can see steeple B in the distance, I'm going to head towards that. And then at steeple B, oh, I see something else. I see roof C, I'm going to head towards that. So they're piloting, they're steeple chasing. They don't necessarily know that it's left or right. They just know that I am here and I see that location and I'm going to go to that location. So that is another kind of map that is assumed that birds have. What researchers did is they took these birds from their home loft and displaced them to a random location. What did the birds do? So that is my own personal cue to make art. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me. So the first time they displaced these birds, these birds made really wonky journeys. So they went up and down and around and sideways and made lots of loop-de-loops, but eventually somehow, they were able to end up at their home. The second time the researchers captured these very same birds and brought them back to another location, well, the birds still made a bit of a loop-de-loop -loop and made a bit of a weird trajectory, but they did end up back home. The third time, they were pretty straightforward. They kind of had an idea and they eventually made it back home. And the more and more often they did this, they found that the birds kept on following the same path over and over and over again. What that looks like in terms of the data, um, let me just remove this here. What they looks like in terms of the data is these blue lines are the very early trials of these birds. So the first time they were being displaced from one location to another, but eventually the red lines show that the more and more they became familiar with being displaced, they were able to keep repeating the same route over and over again. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that this was the best route. Obviously, there seems to be no same route across all of these different pigeon individuals, but it's the fact that each individual had its own very specific route that it took and that it stuck to 
why this relates to landmarks and the landscape is when we look at the actual trajectories that the pigeons took. So here, it's taking these different paths to go to from one end of the picture to another end of the picture, but somehow they're all converging over this very distinct landscape feature. It's this circular roundabout that scare me as a driver, but apparently it's helpful to birds. Um, and it seems like no matter where they're coming in from, they're always going to the right of the roundabout. So this goes back to this idea of piloting and mosaic map. They know that there is some feature that I have to go near there. And from that feature, I can then go past. And it seems like they have these different features in their mind that they keep coming back to and then using to navigate. And so when we see something like this on the screen where we're able to distinguish different features, we also think that birds can distinguish features like that. And not only that, they're using features like that in order to navigate. Perfect. Um, that brings us back to home, which brings us back to the end. Um, and I just want to say thank you. A good chunk of you stuck around right till the really end. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for giving me your time um, and lending me your eyes and ears. And I hope that was at least somewhat helpful or interesting. Um, but yeah, thank you for spending your time with me and for this lovely Friday evening. I really yeah. appreciate it. I think people loved it. It was so fascinating, so interesting. Um, I learned so much and it seems like a lot of people learned a lot too. Um, there's so many great comments in the chat. Um, I think we just have a couple minutes for questions um, just so that we can let Aranya uh, take a break after this very long presentation. <laughs> um, a really good question came in from Terrence on Facebook, actually. Um, his question was, um, as an astronomy enthusiast, I wanted to ask if researchers actually use the light of the moon to help track nighttime bird migration. I stumbled upon this phenomenon by pure accident while observing the mo moon with a telescope during the fall. I saw so many bird silhouettes fly across the face of the moon that it was almost distracting. That's amazing. That's a really good question, Terrence. Um, as far as I know, they aren't really using, the researchers aren't using the moon as help in order to figure out um, what the birds are doing. At this point, the best way to really understand how the birds are interacting with the landscape is to slap a radio tracker on them and then see what they're doing. So at banding stations, we now have these little miniature tags that we put on birds that almost give us real-time information of how the birds are traveling. And so we don't necessarily have to use things like the moon's light, but it is very possible that the birds are using the moon's light in order to navigate. And for us to be able to detect that, we use that radio tracked bird and put it with moon data in order to really understand the fluctuations of the bird's navigation. So it's just a more accurate way that researchers have found. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it's just that step where we are in research that's really helping us understand how birds navigate. Awesome. Francine asked, um, how does environmental changes affect birds that use landmarks that disappear due to these changes, um, like new structures, high rises, fields that are built up, forests that are destroyed? Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good question, Francine. Um, the research that they've done, especially with landmarks, there was a really interesting paper that came out of Italy that looked at how birds are navigating based on human highways. So how they're using that leading line of a highway in order to know where they are. And it seems like birds are using these kind of urban features maybe in order to navigate in a totally different way because to them, it's just a landscape feature. But with that also comes all of different problems. For example, how is that highway there in the first place? Did forests and trees have to be cut down for it? And what was the other purpose of these forests and trees? For example, if the pigeon was coming and resting in those forests and trees, well, that has an environmental impact on it because it can no longer do that. And then things like cornfields and you know agriculture that are drastically changing the landscape, it's possible that birds are changing their landscape ideas in relation to that or maybe here they're using other cues because to them they sense that something is off. 
Um, but in the larger scale of habitat change, yes, it has an importance because things like landscape and landmarks have multiple purposes for this bird. It's not necessarily just for navigation. It's also for things like food and nesting and protection. So that part of the answer kind of delegates to the other parts of the bird's life. And I'm, I'm getting some funny um, comments. Um, somebody said, your webinar makes me want to go back to school and become your student. <laughs> Thank you. That's I love great. That. Um, someone said, oh my god, I loved it. Info overload though, but so awesome. Yeah. And Heather, yes, lots of information. <laughs> uh, this is going to be recorded and posted on YouTube afterwards, so you can always go back and go through all of the topics that Aranya talked about today. Mm. I think we'll have one more question before I let you go. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. There's a lot coming at you right now. Um, Derek asked, um, or said, you've done a great job of making all this information so much easier to understand. What is the most important thing we can do to make bird conservation more accessible? To make bird conservation more accessible? Ooh, that's a good question. That is a good um, <laughs> I am going to stick with the answer that I tend to stick with, and it's not the most sciencey answer, um, but the best thing you can do is go birding. Like, I am only got into conservation of birds through birding. I only became passionate for it because I have a connection to it. So if you go out there and you make a connection with the bird, it's only something that you love that you try and protect. So the more and more you get into the birds, you more and more you understand how they're fascinating creatures, the more you'll just find ways to, you know, support them and support places that conserve land is the biggest thing in supporting organizations that are doing righteous conserve conservation of lands and in very um, ethical and practical ways. That is the biggest thing because the thing within our control is landscape. Um, and so if when we can control that to make it more accessible would be conser conserving things like landscape and then putting information near that and getting people out there to interact with it. So true. I think birding is definitely the gateway to conservation, yes. <laughs> caring about the environment and um, yeah, definitely get out there. It can be intimidating. And we've talked about that before. There's so many sounds and there's mm. experts out there that know everything and it can be scary topic, but um, it's for sure like, I'm so excited to be able to um, hopefully meet you on site and we can travel around Riverwood with uh, some participants and, and look at birds together. And um, I'm really excited to hopefully get back on site and do programs in person about this stuff too. Um, I think that's all we have time for tonight. Um, Aranya, thank you so much for all of your time and your expertise. Such a fascinating um, and informative presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to say, please follow Aranya on Instagram. Her name is Nerd Meets Bird. It's down below on her um, picture there. And also, if you have the financial means today to support Riverwood, our conservation and our programs, please consider donating as well. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank mm -hmm. you again, Aranya. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Thank you for your participation, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good night.